Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Ask the Instructor. My name is John Carismo and this show is brought to you by the Tampa School of Real Estate. We're here every single Wednesday to help you understand the technical side of the real estate industry and especially when this technical side translates to actually making money. So the listing process, what we're going to be mainly focusing on today is something that you want to master. Because when you can list properties for sale, you get inventory. And inventory is an important concept to a business. Now, you have almost infinite inventory through the MLS. And I don't want to say infinite because there is only so many properties for sale out there, but compared to your listing inventory, there's so many other properties listed by other cooperating brokerages where you could work with a buyer. They don't necessarily have to be your listing that they're buying. You could still earn a cooperating commission selling another agent's listing. And that's fine and dandy, but if you want to grow your business and scale your business and build your business bigger than just one deal at a time or, or always looking for the next buyer, you know, if you're doing any sort of farming or targeted marketing, if you have a farm area, an area it is that you're focusing on, that you're trying to become known as the real estate expert in the area, listings validate that claim. If you want to be considered an expert in your area, you need to do whatever it is that you can to attain the listings in that area. All of them. You want them all. You know, when we were maybe getting in the borderline of I'm not advising any, you know, sort of antitrust or anything like that. It's still a competitive market. People can try to compete. But if you're just that good, if you're just that well known, if you're just that that much of an expert in the eyes of the people that are in this area, they won't use other people. Or at least you're going to be the person they consider first. And maybe they've got somebody who's willing to do it for less and they don't understand the value it is that you're providing. And there are so maybe clients that you maybe don't want to work with. But the beauty of having a business as opposed to just a job is you could grow this thing to be bigger than yourself where you have business lined up for you. And the best way to build that platform, that that level of success is through listings, through listings. You know, listings are, again, your inventory. This is what you have to sell, what you have to market. That, that's really the key thing about this is what you have to market. Because I could sit here and I could say, hey, use me. I'm going to be the best real estate professional there is. Here's my five-star reviews. Here's, here's this. Here's that. They want to see real estate. That's what makes somebody interested first and foremost is seeing the actual real estate. And then we come secondary as the real estate professional. I mean, sometimes we're even seen as a necessary requirement rather than a value proposition. And through effective marketing, you could reframe that but getting in early with people selling their homes, I mean, you have guaranteed buyers, basically. And even if they're moving out of your area, or maybe you don't even want to work with buyers. You know, I talked to a lot of new agents. They're like, yeah, I really want to focus on sellers. And then some of them will say they want to focus on buyers. But here's the thing. You could get both and only work with who it is that you choose to work with and refer out whatever additional business you can't handle or doesn't fit your business model or whatever it is. And referral fees are typically anywhere from like 20 to 30 percent. They're negotiable. They're negotiable, of course, so they could always be higher or lower than that. But, you know, a 25 percent referral fee isn't something that is usually out of the question. Again, negotiable. That's all the antitrust stuff. I can't say what they are because there is no set amount. It's always a negotiable amount. Just like anybody can choose to pick an area as their farm area. You know, anybody tries to intimidate you and say, this is my turf. What do you mean? You're trying to violate antitrust laws by saying I can't operate in your market. 
because that's essentially what that is. So there is nobody's turf, there is nobody's territory. Now there might be, you know, with franchises and things like that, they, they get weird about territories and all kinds of things like that. But for your business, your business as a real estate professional, and this is gonna be pretty much universal unless your broker says otherwise. And if you don't have a real estate license yet, once you do get one, if you wanna be able to broker deals, you first have to register with a broker for two years before you're able to earn your own broker license and work completely independently if you choose to do so. Or like a lot of agents, they just remain with their current broker. Some will get broker licenses and be a broker associate, while others will just remain as a sales associate. Or you could start your own brokerage in as little as two years. But you have to get started and have to get going. And one of the easiest ways to balance in real estate when you're doing real estate on a part-time basis is through listings. So for anyone that's looking to get into real estate and maybe you're just starting out, maybe you only have so many hours it is you can dedicate to this, listings will give you a way better return on your time invested. Now, you can't always pick and choose. Now, buyers typically take a little bit longer of working time. There may be a little bit more, I don't wanna say needy, but in terms of according to statistics from the National Association of Realtors and the hours it takes to work with a buyer versus a seller, it's three times as many hours to work with a buyer. So that's yet another reason why you wanna become a mega listing master. Or at least think like a mega listing master because when you think like that, you're focused on things that will grow your real estate business. So look, we've got a great show for you today. We're gonna be talking about the listing process, breaking it down all the way from getting clients in the first place, getting listing clients in the first place, taking this all the way to the closing process. And again, according to the National Association of Realtors, this is eight hours of working time. If this is an average priced home in the Tampa Bay area, the average priced home in Tampa is around 458,000 right now in the Tampa Bay area. And at a 3% commission, that's like over $13,000 in gross commission and just about $10,000 if you're on a 70-30 split or whatever your split might be with your brokerage. But let's say it's $10,000 it is that you're walking away with. If that's taking you eight hours to earn that $10,000, you're making over $1,000 per hour, about $1,200 per hour. So crazy. Uh, that you could do that. Working with a buyer, on average, it takes about 24 hours, according to the National Association of Realtors. So then you're maybe looking at about $400 an hour if you break it down that way. But that's what you could potentially be in the range of. And, and now if you look at this from a business perspective, and yes, you'll have business expenses as well, and none of this is guaranteed. This is your business, so you could build more than this. You could do less than this. When you're first starting out, it's gonna take longer as you're learning and you're becoming more of an expert. But let's again use these average numbers from the Association of Realtors. If you could focus on building your business around the eight hour time frame versus the 24 hour time frame, whether you're just starting out or you're somebody who has been practicing real estate for years, if you're trying to grow your business, which clients can you take on more? Can you take on more eight hour clients or can you take on more 24 hour clients? You can take on three eight hour clients for the amount of time you would give to a 24 hour buyer client. So three sellers for the time it is you could dedicate to one buyer according to average numbers. Your business may be different. This is information you wanna to try to track. Uh, if, you, if anyone's ever seen how attorneys like Bill Hours, they log all the work it is that they're doing for each client, that's not necessarily something you would do to bill your clients, but something you should be doing to track how much time it is that you're spending. Because if you're spending like 60, 70 hours with people, when on average it takes 24 hours, well, what are you doing that's taking so much extra time? How could you fine tune that process? And again, this is all part of being the, the CEO of your business, looking for ways to optimize and, and increase efficiency. But again, one of the end all be all things it is that you could do that's basically guaranteed. If you could, again, just attain the average levels of this. If you're an average buyer's agent versus being an average listing agent, an average listing agent takes a third of the amount of time and it's usually about the same amount of money. It actually could be potentially more money because you're in control of negotiating the overall commission for the transaction from the listing position. So the brokerage working with the seller, working with the, that's the listing agent, listing the property for sale, they usually negotiate the commission for the entire transaction. But we're gonna talk more about this in the process today. We've got a great show for you. My name is John Carissimo. You're watching Ask the Instructor.
You are watching Ask the Instructor. Absorb the knowledge. Become the expert. Alrighty, welcome back to this week's episode of Ask the Instructor, brought to you by the Tampa School of Real Estate. And we're live on Facebook right now, as well as YouTube, as well as our Success Center. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. You can hit that little bell icon if you uh, would prefer to get notifications through Facebook or YouTube, or if you go right to tampaschool.com, you can drop in your email pretty much anywhere on that website, and it should give you the option to subscribe for our updates. So drop in your email on the website, and we'll send out these videos whenever it is we do these every week, every Wednesday, every Friday, and we have all kinds of content that we put out in between. And the reason why we do this is we know that starting a real estate career is so much more than just what you're doing in a 63-hour course. We're on a mission at the Tampa School of Real Estate to be more than a required course because to be successful in real estate, it takes more than just the required course to get your real estate license. That's where you get started. And yes, there's additional courses like taking your post licensing. Uh, there's additional training it is you'd be doing through your real estate broker. It's continuing education you have to do every two years. So there's a lot of requirements, but again, there's so much more information to have. And this is, again, no charge, no fees, no obligations. Just tune in. <laughs> We're here every week. Feel free to share this. That's how you can really uh, uh, thank us for these episodes. Is If you find this information useful, definitely share this with your friends, family, other real estate professionals. Because anybody wanting to start a real estate career or take their real estate career to the next level, we want to help be part of that process. And so we're here to share what it is that we, we have, which is information and knowledge about real estate and how to make money with a real estate license. Because there's what I've realized. If I knew what I knew now about real estate and having a real estate license and the opportunities that exist, if I know what I knew now 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I would be in such a different place. But we, don't, we can't just use, like, what is that Adam Sandler movie where he's got the remote and he's rewinding stuff? Maybe you guys over on Facebook uh, know what I'm talking about. Who we got in here today? Welcome in, Frank. All right, Liz is here, my wonderful wife, wife who also now has a real estate license as well. We've got in, her in on it. She's only doing it part-time. She likes her day job too much. But she is enjoying making some extra money on the side. So... She has definitely like taking control of that aspect. What's going on, Sunset Mike? Welcome in. Welcome, Mioka. Yeah, Click, that's what it was. Click, thank you, Mike. Click was the movie. Where you can just go back and rewind. And if I could do that and go back and knowing what it is that I know now, whew, imagine what it is that I could have done. But we don't have that luxury. So what I'm trying to do here is save your time. Because I know a lot of people are interested in getting into a real estate career because they, they don't want to trade time for money because what you eventually realize is you only have so much time to give. There's literally infinite money. There's literally infinite money. There is no limit to the money. Wrap your brain around that concept for a second. There is no limit to the amount of money it is that's out there, but there is a limited amount of time it is that you have to attain that money. And so... Again, focusing on listings. Now, again, you can still get buyers, and if you have the time available to work with these buyers, then absolutely. But if it doesn't fit, if it's outside of your area, if you'd have to travel too far to work with this and that travel time is gonna eat up too much of your time, you could always refer that business out. Again, maybe a 25% referral fee. You negotiate some sort of referral fee with a local expert in that area. It doesn't even have to be from your same brokerage. You could refer business even outside of the state of Florida. If, if you've got friends or family that want to buy real estate literally anywhere, if they go through you making the connection, you could earn a referral fee. So that's crazy. Um, but again, that's something that if you're looking to balance and 
if, if you know that buyers take three times the amount of time and you're trying to focus your business on listings and you're actually pretty busy with listings, two options. You either refer that business out or you start building a real estate team where you have your own team of buyer's agents. And that's how a lot of teams get started is, is you have agents who get really good at doing listings. You have agents that become listing experts and then they don't have time to work with buyers just because again, buyers take three times the amount of time on average. Maybe your business will be different based on how you're, you're working with your clients. But overall, imagine three, uh, uh, three times the amount of time, there's only so much business you could do. But look, let's talk less about the time, speaking of time, and let's get into the actual listing process. So now, Again, you starting out, you might not be able to get this all done in eight hours, especially as you're learning about listings more and you're becoming more of an expert in listings. What these National Association of Realtor statistics are that I keep referencing are average statistics from average agents. But here's the thing, the average agent doesn't really exist. Averages are made up numbers. So what that means is there's actually agents that do this in less time than eight hours, as well as agents who take significantly longer. And it's all a balancing act between what it is that you're doing in the business and maybe how good it is that you are doing it. Because at first, that's the one thing I can almost guarantee is you're gonna be the least efficient at first. Maybe you get lucky and you go really smoothly through a transaction, but chances are there's gonna be some hiccups, there's gonna be some bumps along the way, there's gonna be some obstacles to get along. And so it's probably not gonna take eight hours the first time it is that you do this. But the better it is that you get at this, you could even get to do this faster than in eight hours of time. But what does this all start with, with, with a listing? Where does it begin? Well, you have to find a potential seller. So we need to get a potential seller. And where are we gonna get a potential seller from? Well, there's all kinds of sources of potential sellers. We could get this maybe somehow from the internet lot of various ways we could get this from the internet. We could get this from, from our sphere of influence. So people it is that we know, we could get potential sellers from past clients. And maybe our past clients are giving us referrals. Now we cannot pay somebody who does not have a real estate license. If you don't have an active real estate license, you cannot earn compensation for the referral of real estate services. You must have an active real estate license to earn compensation for referral services. But there's referral brokerages that, that you could join that allow you to basically hang your license there where you don't have to join the Association of Realtors and pay all the big board fees and MLS fees and all the other stuff because you're not practicing real estate. So that's the catch of these referral brokerages is you're not able to practice real estate, but you're able to refer the business out to, to an agent actually with those tools who is practicing real estate, who is a member of the Association of Realtors. And again, whatever referral fee it is, you negotiate 25%, anything like that. But you might also get those referrals from your sphere. And here's the thing, if you're doing a good job with these internet leads, they'll become either part of your sphere or they'll become past clients. And that again, increases further opportunities for more referrals. The bigger your sphere of influence is, the more past clients it is that you have, the more referrals it is that you will get. And these are the best types of leads, these referrals. They're as close as you could get to a past client as a past client. You know, probably that's the only one that'd be easier as a past client becoming a potential seller. And again, there's all kinds of ways you could do this off the internet, um, but we could also even talk about face-to-face. -face. That could be, for example, uh, for the internet, we could say like social, all your social networks. We could say Google ads. We'll just say ads in general, because there's, there's ads all over the place, Facebook, Google, 
Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, so all kinds of different ways you could advertise on the internet to get potential sellers. Face to face, you could find them through uh, door knocking. And also community events. And also open houses. So a lot of face-to-face -face opportunities to get potential sellers as well, but we're still not done because there's also the phone. And you could be calling expired listings. You could be calling for sale by owner listings. There's also getting to these people through the mail. And this could be all kinds of postcards, letters. Uh, we won't go into details on that. You guys know what the mail looks like. But all kinds of different ways it is you could mail to your farm area to get potential sellers. So a lot of people are focused on this. This is what a lot of people focus in on here is I need a seller. I need to find a seller. I need to focus in and find a seller. But then the question is, how many ways is it that you have in your business to find sellers? Because if you don't have this whole web of all these potential sources of leads here, you know, also maybe your office. Office or team leads. These usually come at some sort of referral fee as well, some sort of percentage, maybe an additional commission split or anything like that potentially. Uh, you could also have referral networks. Uh, one more we could put on here. And we could even continue to go on. And what I mean by referral network is as you start to refer business to other agents, they'll refer business back to you. You know, usually people want to work with people it is that they're already working with. So if you're sending them business and they've got a client that fits for your market or wherever it is that you are, you can get that business back to you again to potentially get more sellers. And we could go on and on. We've done episodes like this, but that's again for the first place of where are you going to get this seller from? How can you be everywhere? And we could really detail this out further when we're talking about social media, when we're talking about digital advertising, when we're talking about what you could do through the mail, when we're talking about different face-to-face -face activities, or talking about how you could reach out to your sphere of influence or past clients or, or other ways it is you can get leads from the internet. But you gotta have somewhere to get these potential sellers, number one. And it might just be somebody that you know. And chances are you know somebody that needs your services. Or they might know somebody who they could refer to you. This could be coworkers, this could be family members, this could be people that you used to work with, people that you're friends with on LinkedIn or so, uh, Facebook or whatever social media it may be. They could all get you potential sellers. Now, what do you do next once you have this potential seller? Once you have this potential seller, somebody potentially wanting to sell, you've located them, you've found them. They're potentially interested in doing business with you, or are they? Are they really interested in doing business with you? Do they really even want to sell their home? Do they even know where they're at in an equity position on their property? So how is it that you turn this potential seller into a listing? Now, if this person is literally raising their hand saying, I want to sell my property, we could just jump right to, okay, let's get into the details. Let's discuss the agreement for listing the property for sale. Let's discuss the price it is you're going to be listing it for and getting right to some of those details. But maybe you're out here, let's say you're out doing something face to face. Maybe this is a nosy neighbor you're meeting at the open house. Maybe you're at a community event talking to neighbors. Maybe you're out door knocking, knocking on doors, and you're meeting somebody. You know, maybe just when you're out and about. That's another one we could put up here. Just as you're out and about, if you wear your name tag or a shirt that has your brokerage logo on it or says something about real estate, it's crazy how often people want to talk about real estate. It's the number three thing that people need behind food and water. Water and food, I should say. So depending how far along it is, 
they are in this process, you might be able to skip some of these steps. But one of the things it is that, and we want to frame this all around, not necessarily what we should be doing, but how do we best serve the client, depending on which stage it is that they're at, even if they're not necessarily our client yet. And so typically, one of the things that kind of really first sparking a deeper conversation other than marketing, uh, you know, let's also talk about that. Let's talk about nurturing. So we got a potential seller, but maybe it's just an email that came in off the internet through our website. Maybe we have a website and we got them to sign up for an email. So we've got a potential seller. Maybe they, they requested a property report. Uh, they wanted a CMA or evaluation of the property. And then for sure, we know there's somebody who probably is thinking about selling. But what if they just register as a buyer on your website? Because here's the thing. These people are not selling their homes to become homeless. They're selling their home to buy another home. They're not gonna sell their home and just not have a home anymore. So a lot of times sellers will end up being buyers before they're sellers. Almost that whole argument, that whole idea of putting the cart before the horse, if you've ever heard about that one before. You know, you're, normally a horse is pulling a cart, you put the, the cart in front, the horse is gonna be like, hey, there's this cart in the way, can't really pull it, there's this cart in the way. So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So how do you nurture somebody who's potentially a seller? Not just a potential seller, they're potentially a seller. They're thinking about it. They're not sure if they wanna sell because first they've gotta find another place it is that they wanna live. So maybe part of our nurturing campaign is property search alerts. So what do we wanna find out from this potential seller if we can? Where would you wanna live? Where would you wanna to move to? Where do you live now and where are you thinking of going to? What's driving your decision to move? But we gotta show them properties, property search alerts in those targeted areas it is they're interested in. And you might already see that if your website collects this data and it has an IDX feed from your MLS showing all these properties, if you've ever been on one of those brokerage websites, kind of like Zillow, where it shows properties that are available, there's website technology where when someone's logged in, you could track that on an individual basis to see what properties people are looking at, which ones they're favoriting, which ones they want to see more of. And that's, again, part of nurturing, because if you could be on brand while they're doing this, Again, remember, inventory is the big thing here. And this is the beauty of using the MLS and the IDX websites is you have so much inventory it is you could borrow in addition to your own inventory of your own listings. But when we're, again, talking about how else we can nurture, maybe tips for sale. Any way we could provide some sort of tips for sale, maybe tips for buying, tips for upgrading, any sort of tips, guides, information which is also what this is over here. We're sending them information, usually more visual property information, but we're sending them information either way. And that's how we nurture them more to the point where they're considering. When they start considering is when they start to understand their equity. If they do not understand their equity, they will not be considering selling. I'll say that again. If they do not understand their equity, they will not consider selling. Now, maybe that term equity, maybe that one is a new one. This is one of the ones covered in pre-licensing. So this is covered right in the first course it is you take to get your real estate license. You might remember it if you've already taken this course, if you're new, if you haven't gotten your real estate license yet, the equity is how much is your property's value minus your loan balance, to put it the simplest way possible. So whatever it is that's outstanding for your mortgage loan, if, if you own your property free and clear with no mortgage loan, you'd basically have 100% equity, meaning what you sell your property for minus any closing costs and commissions is gonna be what you'd walk away with. Versus if you have a loan, that loan has to be paid off when you sell your property, so whatever money's left over before closing costs is the equity. 
And so when a seller starts to understand the equity it is that they have in their property, that's when they're going to be considering selling on a realistic level. They might have thought about selling before, but they won't consider it as a legitimate option unless they understand the financial impact of this decision. And that is, again, understanding the equity. And the way it is that you do that is for, through valuations. So prior to somebody selling the property, again, you might be able to skip this nurturing step. Maybe they're more ready to go. They don't need nurturing they're more ready to go, they're already considering because maybe they already kind of have an idea because maybe they saw a valuation somewhere and they're like, you know what? I might want to sell. You know what? That sounds really, really good. I probably could walk away with a lot of money. I'm considering selling. And now the next step is going to be moving forward. And this is when they start making repairs or cleaning. They're getting the property ready for sale. They've decided, they've considered, they've decided and considered and realized they want to sell the property, so they're going to be moving forward now. And the way it is that we ultimately secure this moving forward is through a listing agreement. And the listing agreement leads to the actual listing. But we're not going to get to the listing without the listing agreement. And we're going to probably have some sort of appointments to get that listing agreement. There's probably a listing appointment it is that you'll be doing so you maybe give some sort of presentation of how it is that you're going to get the property sold, what it is you're going to do to market it, why they should choose you as opposed to any other brokers it is they may be considering. That's going to be in this stage here of them moving forward. And any way you can help be involved in the process of understanding, you know, what are the ideal repairs to make, what is it that needs to be fixed or changed about the property to get top dollar, to get that highest level valuation you potentially could for the property, what are the terms of actually listing it going to look like? So many people think the listing agreement is just the contract. No, the agreement is the agreement that you're making with your client. And a lot of that agreement is done verbally rather than on paper. Now, it's made legal on paper. That's what you're doing here. It, it, but, but the reality is, if you have a listing less than one year, anything verbally spoken to is also part of the agreement. And so all the things it is that you're talking about, that you're agreeing to, that's all building the listing agreement. If you want to get to an actual signed listing agreement, you need to use agreement to get there. What are the terms of the agreement? What is it that you agree with? What do you not agree with? What are the disagreements between you and your client? Because any of the disagreements are going to keep you from getting to an agreement. But once you actually have that listing agreement signed, you now move into the actual listing process. And so now that listing, you're going to be marketing. That is the name of the game. And the biggest thing that you're doing usually is just putting this in the MLS. Honestly, even if you do no marketing yourself, just putting it in the MLS, the property will sell if it's priced appropriately. That's the only thing that's going to stop the property from selling as long as you put it in the MLS. Because the MLS is such a huge pool of potential buyers working with all different brokers looking for potentially this property that you have listed for sale. And the MLS is actually how most properties get sold. As part of the listing agreement here, you're agreeing to the overall commission and you're putting the cooperating commission in the MLS. So for anyone considering joining the realtors in the MLS, that's what you're really paying for. Not a database of properties because any sort of technology could provide a database of properties. What you're paying for is the agreement. By becoming a member of the MLS, you're a member to all the agreements for all the listings in the MLS and whatever the cooperating commission specified in that MLS is. So you don't have to make phone calls with every agent saying, hey, do you have a cooperating commission? Hey, do you have a cooperating commission? Hey, do you have a cooperating commission? Every listing in the MLS has a cooperating commission. So if you bring a buyer, 
that's what you get paid. You can look that up right at the bottom of every listing when you're logged into the MLS. So that's the big part of what the MLS is and why that costs money. Again, if you're looking to practice real estate without the MLS, you could do that in a referral capacity. You join a referral brokerage, you won't be practicing real estate yourself, but you can refer any leads you have to an actual agent, and when they close the deal, you get whatever percentage of a referral fee it is you agreed to, maybe 25%, again, it's negotiable. But getting back to the listings here, you're marketing it, you, you have it in the MLS, you're maybe doing an open house, and when I say maybe, I say, I mean, if you're smart, you're doing an open house, not necessarily try to get the property sold. Because honestly, what most likely is going to do that is having a good MLS listing. Maybe some of the marketing it is that you're doing is going to potentially give you an edge. But the reason why it is that you're marketing this and holding open houses is because this is the most powerful way to market your business is through marketing for your clients. It's almost like you're riding on your own coattails. It is you're, you're, you're basically doubling down in the benefits of advertising. Is What you're advertising is you're advertising your clients' listings. What better way to spend your marketing dollars than actually advertising for your clients? But what better way to spend your marketing dollars than advertising yourself actually selling real estate? That's a way better advertisement than any ad that you could do on, hey, look at my reviews. Hey, look at, look at this here. Look at what I could do. Look at what I could do. Who remembers that one show on the TV with the kid that would jump around and just say, look what I could do. That's what your postcards are when you're talking about yourself or whatever ad is that you're talking about yourself. It's just like, hey, look what I could do. We're here really today to say what you can, what you can do. And that's why you might be interested in this information. And as a realtor, what you can do is what I just did here. You want to sell your house? Well, look at this house that I'm selling. Look at what I'm selling right here. That could be you. You could be selling your house. You could be selling your house, and you could be getting all this equity. Not as some closing costs and commissions, of course. But this could be you. This could be you. You could be selling. You could be living here. Because remember, if they're earlier on, if they're in the nurturing part of this process here, that's where you want them looking at other properties available for sale. And maybe that's what's triggering them to want to sell as they found their dream home. The one that they're in right now is maybe just a starter home. And this is their dream home. So you know what? We are no longer in the nurturing stage. We're no longer considering. We're ready to start moving forward. We're ready to start moving forward. And once we get a listing agreement, we'll be listing our property for sale. We find the right realtor. We get the listing agreement with them. But then what comes next? What's next in this process here after the listing? We'll say the contract, just to kind of go in broader strokes, because we could really get down into details of, of little steps, but ultimately getting to a contract. And the way it is that you get to a contract is you're going to have all kinds of offers. And you're going to be negotiating. Offers in negotiation. And then the next step is the closing. Which this is why really, especially on the seller side, with working as a listing agent for the seller, why there's significantly less work compared to a buyer's agent because a lot of the contract to close activities are going to fall on the buyer side typically. There's still going to be some things that is you have to do, but as far as the listing agent goes, what you have to do is much more minimal compared to what the buyer agent has to keep track of and make sure things are going on uh, on track. Now, a good listing agent, especially because you got the extra time, You'll have systems and processes to make sure that that other side of the transaction is holding up their side, that everything's moving along, that you're doing anything it is that you can to help out because really they, they have the big burden with all the activities and duties it is they have to get done with their buyers to get to the closing. But again, this is probably the biggest reason why is again this process of going from contract to closing when you're working just with the seller and just on the listing side is a lot less work. You have different contingency periods and things like that, and you might fall out of contract. But then again, if you've already got other offers on the table, it might just be negotiating some of those other offers to get back under 
contract. Deal could fall through for some reason. That does absolutely happen. It's a very common thing. Maybe it's financing. Maybe it's something with the appraisal of the property. Maybe it's with the inspection. That's very common. That happens, which is why you want to position yourself for multiple offers. So if one of those deals falls through, you could have some backup offers on the table to still stay on track to get to the closing. That's the biggest mistake most sellers make is they think they only need one buyer for this property. But the reality is you don't just need one buyer for the property. You need as many buyers as you could get. Because what that does is that drives up the price. And that has been made more obvious just because that's kind of the nature of the market, especially here in Florida right now, is the bidding wars, the, the increases in the prices, and so on and so forth. That, that's very evident in the market, so people kind of understand that, that, okay, I, I want to try to get multiple offers. But the other side of it is, especially when prices keep going up like the market is now, this is where people start to get unrealistic sometimes with the price it is they think their property can sell for just because they seem like property prices are just going up and skyrocketing and there's multiple offers, so why can't I sell my little little two-bedroom, one-bath house for $900,000? Well, that's because there's other two-bedroom, one-bath houses for $250,000, $200,000, maybe in that range. And that's called the principle of substitution, another concept you're learning about in your pre-licensing course, or if you've already taken that, you might remember that concept of principle of substitution. That's very important in understanding the valuation of the property, is understanding the principle of substitution. But then ultimately, a couple more steps it is that you want to do after the closing is follow-up. And the reason why you want to follow up after the closing is number one, to potentially have a past client here. Or number two, to have this past client give you a referral so you have more potential sellers to start this whole process all over again. And this whole little chart here looks pretty crazy when we, we look at it all together of, wow, that's a lot of stuff to be listing do listings and that's why a lot of people get intimidated by listings is they they see this whole like the web of all the stuff that goes on and, and and that goes into listings but here's the thing listings can be very systematized and again that can be intimidating at first if you don't yet have a system for listing but as you start to build your business and develop your system for listing properties for sale you could become very good at it you could become very efficient at it and what it's going to do is it's going to multiply your business because when you market these listings, not only does it help you get buyers, not just potentially a buyer for the listing, but also buyers for other properties that are in the MLS or maybe even other listings if you have many listings. But even if you don't have other listings, you have the MLS or you have cooperating commissions for all the listings by all the other brokers who are members of the MLS. And then, of course, you have the nosy neighbors or, or the people that are in the neighborhood that are interested. And a lot of people, the bad attitude realtors out there, those are the ones that are the ones saying, oh, those are just nosy neighbors. No, no, they're not just nosy neighbors. They're business opportunities because they're people considering selling, and that's why they're nosy. They want to see what this house is selling for. They want to know more about this house because they want to see how it compares to theirs. And, and the reason why a lot of people write them off is because they're just so early on in the nurturing process. And if no one's been nurturing that person, then they might just be nosing around at the open houses next door. But if you develop a strategy for nurturing your clients, buyers, sellers, whoever, you might not know if they're a buyer or a seller yet. If you nurture, the business will come. The fortune is in the follow-up, as they say, and not just the follow-up after the sale, but the follow-up it is that you're doing when you realize your potential seller isn't going to sell right now and you need to do some nurturing. If you do nurturing, if you stay in touch, if you stay in contact and you continue to build this relationship further, it's not a question of if you do business with them, it's a question of when you'll do business with them. So look, that's, a, I think, a pretty good overview of the listing process, really from starting all the way from, again, getting a client all the way to getting to a closing and getting repeat business. Yes, there is going to be more details and specifics on this, and listings are something more that you're going to learn about in post-licensing as well. So there is the listing contract you're learning about and different brokerage relationships and things like that in your pre-licensing, but your post-licensing, you can take that as soon as you have your license in order to use that for credit. 
So as soon as you've got your license, get enrolled in post licensing because it's required for your license renewal, but it'll also teach you essential information for growing your real estate business. So you could again, kind of knock out two tasks in one go, two birds in one stone as they like to say two things done at once. You're meeting your renewal requirement, but you're also learning how to use your real estate license to actually make money with it. And if you're brand new to all of this, I would highly recommend you sign up for our complete jumpstart bundle. Because here's the reality that a lot of the agents are realizing once they have the real estate license is, oh, I got to do the post licensing. It's not just something I, I want to do. It's something I have to do if I want to keep my license longer than 18 months. I need to do post licensing. It's a requirement. You need 45 hours of post licensing. And the bigger reason why you should be doing it now again, is because there's information that'll help you grow your real estate business. And the longer you go, the longer it is that you wait or that you take to get this information to grow your business, the more it is you're delaying your real estate business. And if you delay your success in real estate, you're more likely to lose momentum, to lose steam and not be able to be as effective. So if you need any help getting started, you have questions, call us 813-333-2676. We're here to help you and answer any questions you have every step of the way. That's about all the time we have for today. Make sure you subscribe at tampaschool.com. Drop in your email. We'll be back on Friday for State of Real Estate. Thank you guys for tuning in and I'll see you then. Hey, so if you're thinking about starting a real estate career, it could feel a little overwhelming sometimes. Look, that's completely understandable. That's why we're here to help. If you haven't already, check out our success center, tampaschool.com forward slash success. Or if you don't even know where to begin, give us a call. We'd love to help you out. We've got advisors standing by to answer any questions you have and assist you in any way it is that we can. Our phone number is 813-928-0106. Again, that's 813-928-0106. Give us a call. We're the Tampa School of Real Estate. Do you want a career that allows you to be in control? With a career in real estate, you'll get to call the shots. Whether you're looking at starting part-time or want to become the next top agent, a career in real estate makes it possible. Find out what it takes at tampaschool.com. Do you want to incorporate studying for your real estate exams into your busy schedule? Now you can review the key topics you need to know to pass your class and state exams with our MP3 audio review. Simply pop in your headphones or connect to your car to reinforce crucial information while you exercise or drive. Listen to the first unit for free at mp3audioreview.com. That's mp3audioreview.com. Are you thinking about a career in real estate? Hey, I'm John Christmas with the Tampa School of Real Estate, and we've helped thousands of people just like you obtain their real estate license. If you're thinking about a career in real estate, give us a call. The phone number is 813-928-0106. Our advisors are standing by to answer any questions you have and assist you in any way they can. Hey, if you're enjoying the show today, which I'm sure you are, be sure to hit like, subscribe, post your comments, share with your friends and family. Thank you guys so much for watching. powerful tool to study for your real estate exam is the question simulator from Tampa School of Real Estate. We've used our years of experience in preparing students for the Florida real estate exam to bring you the most powerful exam study tool available. In the question simulator, you'll be able to go directly to a particular unit so you can focus on the sections where you need the most practice. We have also included the percentages of each unit so you know which units are the most important for your real estate exam. Every question will immediately give you detailed feedback which is almost always more important than the question or the answer themselves. After completing all the questions in a particular unit, you can go through question by question and review any that you've gotten wrong. You could also print out a report at the end of each quiz. The Question Simulator from Tampa School of Real Estate is 100% mobile compatible, so you can practice with test questions anywhere you have your phone with you. Enroll now at questionsimulator.com and get ready to pass your exam.
Are you studying for your Florida real estate exam? If you are, you need to check out our Pass First Try strategy. You're gonna love this. It's four steps that we break down the process to study for your Florida real estate exam. So you're set up to pass your Florida real estate exam because that's what you're, you're studying for, right? To pass your exam. It's four steps. Number one, you learn the information. You've gotta learn this to be able to pass the exam, but it doesn't stop at learning. Step two, you've got to reinforce the basic simple key concepts. As you learn this information, keep reviewing the simple things. You don't need to know everything, but you got to review these basic key concepts. Step three, you've got to test your knowledge. The exam's going to test your knowledge, so if you don't test your knowledge in advance, you won't find out if you know what you think you know until you take the exam. And then step four is be confident and prepared, because even if you know this material, you need to be confident that you know the material. Check out the full strategy at PassFirstTry.com. That's PassFirstTry.com. Have you completed your post-licensing education yet? Look, I know you're probably thinking, hey, it's not my renewal deadline, I don't need to do post-licensing yet, but look, here's why you wanna do post-licensing as soon as you've got your real estate license, as soon as you're able to take post-licensing. It's not just another course about arbitrary laws that you're never gonna use again. It's about real world, usable, topics that'll help you grow your real estate business to help you take it to the next level look let me ask you this one question if this course helps you close just one deal if you get one extra deal from post licensing is it worth the investment i'd say it is we get paid pretty well so one deal means a lot of money check out postflorida.com that's postflorida.com for the full details about post licensing